Thanks for coming, everyone. My name is Jesse Galef. I've been a research scientist with Wolfram for a little under two years now. So I'm starting to you know, really get my footing and get to work on some really neat tools about interpretable machine learning uh, and was able to give the first version of this talk a year ago. Uh, this version, there is more stuff. So if you were here last year, there will be some familiar content, but also some new stuff that we're pretty pleased to show off. Um, so the, the problem with machine learning at the moment is that the most powerful and sought after models tend to be the hardest to understand. And uh, there's a particular quote that I really like, I you know might be real, but might be apocryphal that people asked uh, Mr. Babbage, uh, on two occasions I've been asked by members of parliament, pray Mr. Babbage, if you put into the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out? And he said, I'm not able to rightly apprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that would provoke such a question. And that unfortunately seems to be what a lot of people want with machine learning. They want to know that, you know, they're going to put whatever data they have and assume that it's going to give the right answers. Um, the right answers being the ones that they want. So there's some great examples of machine learning algorithms doing the right thing as it was asked, but not quite doing the thing we wanted it to. Um, there's a, a great blog post by the DeepMind safety research team about specification gaming and this little you know, uh, illustration of their reinforcement learning where they were trying to get the robot to simulate an environment, pick up the red Lego and put it on the blue Lego. And it got rewarded for the height of the bottom of the red Lego, if it was about at the the height of the blue Lego uh, when it was not touching the Lego. And so of course, what they discovered it did just flip the thing over and that's much easier. It's not uh, sort of a, the, it's not like it's a smart aleck kid or a malicious genie that takes what you says and twists it. You know, the machines don't know what it is we're asking it to do. It thought that was the goal. Um, and sometimes it finds other ways that we didn't know we, you know, that were an option even. So this is an example that I like to give, but uh, trying to detect which scans had cancer or not, the neural net was doing a really good job of detecting which scans had cancer. But when the scientists looked at how it was doing that and how it was coming to these conclusions, they found that it was actually identifying the little marker for which machine and which hospital the scan came from, because some machines and hospitals are used for the more severe cases. Um, I mean, that's a really great pattern to find. It's just not the one that we thought we were asking for. Uh, so as we do more automated machine learning uh, coming from the, the last talk, we need to have something where there's an iterative back and forth where we help the machine learning algorithm do a better job and then it gives us some answer and we can see whether it's doing the thing we want and help improve it maybe. Um, maybe we can identify some specification gaming, we can uh, figure out some places where we can do data gathering and feature engineering, um, building public trust so that you can explain why the model is gave a particular diagnosis or uh, recommendation. Um, you can identify discriminatory behavior, uh, which is more and more important in I think the law, it's getting uh, important to be able to explain your decisions um, and possibly to suggest ways to intervene. There's always going to be questions of correlation and causation, but um, I, we can address that a little bit near the end, I hope. Um, first tools, if we're going to be interpreting any kind of machine learning algorithm is just to use interpretable models in the first place. Uh, I would not be doing my due diligence if I didn't just mention, yeah, linear regression will often work very well and it's very easy to interpret logistic regression, same thing. Um, but then we'll go into some more of the Wolfram specific tools, um, the information and the predictor classifier measurements tools, um, ice plots, which are new coming out soon, we hope, uh, and SHAP values, which is closer to cutting edge than ice plots, and SHAP plot, which uh, was not around last year and should be pretty new. So we'll do the very first easy versions. And uh, people who have seen my talks know that I like to use this wine data set where you're trying to predict the quality of a bottle of wine based on a number of these 
features about the bottle, you know, fixed acidity and citric acid. And uh, one of these days I will learn about wine so that I have a better understanding of this data set. But at the moment, it's, it is what it is. And uh, I'm treating it as a, you know, they are all numeric features that I vaguely recognize how they might matter. Um, and so if we want a interpretable model that we understand what it's doing to try to predict the quality of a bottle of wine, um, we can do it in a single line, you know, predict the wine train and we're targeting wine quality and we specify that we want a linear regression, which at the moment is, uh, is our goal. And we can use, again, simple, this is what I like about Wolfram Mathematica, um, that there's just a line information and get some information about the predictor. And you can see the methods and the sort of the time that it took, the loss. And you can also see some of the things that it tried over time. So this is, again, the automated um, part from Julio's talk, but that various regularization amounts. And I mean, it's very basic because we forced it to do a linear regression. But um, we can then just explicitly get the function here. So the, I think alcohol was the last feature. Um, for every one value in, of alcohol by whatever units it's uh, in the, the data set, you know, we increase our predicted quality of the bottle of wine by 0.2. Um, that's very explainable. Um, there's a question, ooh, bias. Okay, we can get into bias and various variants near the end. Um, hopefully, we can explain high variance models, which is the closer to SHAP values rather than some of these simpler techniques. Um, but sorry. Uh, another thing that I wanted to point out is that, you know, this is just one particular piece of information to look at. If you look at properties, it'll list all of these things that you can get information about. Uh, so here we can use something similar here, predictor measurements. And again, just get a bunch of sort of baseline information, but then you can get specific information that you ask for, the R squared for this data set. Um, again, a very you know, long list. Um, even just ask for a res residual plot, which can help you identify some non-linearities, for example, that um, this doesn't seem to be too bad, but if the model was typically guessing too low on high values, then uh, you would know there was some kind of particular nonlinearity at play. Um, and, you know, you can just, I mean, you can see how few lines and how easy it is to just get, this is a residual plot for one of the features, total, total uh, sulfur dioxide. And it's not the strongest indication, but the fact that at higher values of sulfur dioxide, the model is too high, typically, and at lower levels, it's too low, indicates that this line is not a particularly good fit for the data, that it's um, a curve of some kind would be better. Um, and for the interpretation, you know, in particular, you can find the examples that it's doing very badly on. You know, there, again, there's this long list of things that you can get information on. And these are just a few of the particular um, things. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but classification, very similar. We can ask whether uh, we a model predicts somebody survived or died. And I'm actually going to force the model to be a logistic regression. OK. Live coding is always going to be dangerous. Um, but again, same sort of thing. Classifier measurements gives you a sort of an overview of how it performed, um, some of the speed for how long it took. And there is this long list of things that you can look at. Uh, I encourage you to play around with them. I don't know what all of them are. To be honest, Scott Pye, I'm now curious about having my eye drawn to that. I think I know the rest. But, um, but yeah, there's just a lot of things that you can pretty easily get information on. Yeah, which brings us a little bit closer to the newer stuff. This is the um, individual conditional expectation data and plots, which is uh, ice plot in the current um, 
property called. And it's sort of what it says, conditional on a particular value for a feature. What is the expectation across various individual examples? Uh, and I think a sort of illustration is the best way to show and explain it that uh, let's take a gradient boosted tree model. This is notoriously difficult to understand what it's doing because it's a collection of different decision trees and they're differently trained. Um, but if we get a measurements object and ask for ice plots, we can see how different bottles of wine. So each line is one bottle of wine. And you see the predicted quality from the model at different levels of free sulfur dioxide. So just take a bottle of wine, which is one line, and pick, you know, force it to be free sulfur dioxide of 60 and see what the model says. Then put it to 70, see what the model says. Um, and we can see that this particular model, this is about the model, not the data. We don't know if the model is good here, but we can understand what it's doing. Uh, we can see that a lot is going on early on at low values of free sulfur dioxide. And that's you know where the, the model is has a lot of change and there's not nearly as much change or um, sort of split points in the trees as you get higher. Um, and it's I find it neat to look at how sort of what insights you can draw for different types of models. So here is a hey, um, linear model and a nearest neighbors model. And we can get the, the ice plots and take a look. Here's just one feature, chlorides. Um, as you can see, the linear one is a linear model. Every single bottle is treated the same, that as you increase the chlorides, the same thing happens to the prediction of quality. Second one was nearest neighbors. And I thought this was really neat that it, there are set predicted values because there are only a certain number of neighbors that it's going to be considering. Um, it's sort of tapering and narrowing. And here's our gradient boosted trees, which um, doesn't have a lot changing near the end. There might be an outlier that uh, is sort of forcing us to graph all of that when it's not all that relevant. But I'm going to try to speed up. Um, and you can get the data and play with it yourself by asking for the ice data. Um, and that allows you to look for yourself at some, some correlation. So this was the ice plot for volatile acidity, but I colored it by the alcohol content. Um, so the red is higher levels of alcohol. And you can see that for the high alcohol bottles of wine, it doesn't seem like the volatile acidity changes its content, its uh, predicted quality all that much. But at lower values of alcohol, it does. Um, maybe useful, maybe not. It's something that you can start to dive into with the ice data itself. Um, but that's only one feature at a time. You know, it's it takes a little bit more work to actually start to see connections and context there, uh, which brings us to the chat values, which because we love self-referential acronyms and backronyms, uh, it's Shapley Additive Explanations for SHAP. Uh, and it comes from Lloyd Shapley, who won a Nobel Prize in economics for this particular way to give credit in a group. When a group of people are achieving a goal, um, if you remove one person, how do you know what their contribution was? Uh, and this can work for any model, black box or not. Uh, it explains a decision sort of one at a time, and it can find much more complex interdependencies. Uh, and it works by looking at if your model knew a particular feature value or not, for your example, how does that change the predicted quality? So every combination of features, the, you know, the power set here. So as an example, if you're predicting income from age, gender, and job, you can try the model with no features given, all features given, and see how much changes. But if you want to know the impact of age, you end up looking at the comparison no features in what the model says to only age or job compared to age and job. Um, and so these comparisons are the game theoretic way. Mathematically, a lot of great properties to it. But 
one of the problems is that it explodes in complexity very quickly by the number of features. And so uh, what we need to do is sample a bunch. And so it's an approximation. It's not the exact mathematical solution, but it's still pretty darn good. Um, and we can see it in action, sort of how it works. Here's a, a bottle of wine. Let's see what the, uh, the gradient boosted tree says. It says that our bottle of wine is about one quality lower. And why is that? Well, here we go. Um, let's actually, you know, these are the, the numbers themselves, but let's bar chart it. So this is the impact of each feature. Um, our alcohol content lowered the prediction by 0.5. That was the biggest impact. In fact, almost nothing about our bottle of wine was good. Um, the volatile acidity helped a little bit, but this is, you know, I, this explains why we had a, such a bad time the first time. And this is the sort of mathematical thing about Shapps, the additive part of Shapley additive explanations, that the total of all those Shap values is the exact difference between the mean value and your predicted value of this bottle. Uh, so each, the difference between the prediction and the mean is what you're dividing up to add up to um, uh, all the attribution for the difference. Uh, again, not taking too long, but uh, it also works for classifiers. Um, the thing that it does with classifiers is gives the odd multipl odds multiplier. So here we're looking at the explanation for why a particular person was predicted to survive, very strongly predicted to survive. Um, let's see what, what person we were looking at. First class, 24 and female. Um, and so the odds of them surviving, according to this Shap value uh, calculation, is that because they were first class, their odds of surviving were multiplied by four. Uh, and because they were female, their odds of surviving were multiplied by five about. Um, it's pretty neat. And uh, is it ice? Uh, I don't think I have time for ice plots for this. Um, mm -hmm. I can get back to questions in a minute. I think I have time for, for some cool stuff, but um, uh, yeah. Let's, let's keep going for it. Um, so one thing you can do as you know, you've noticed this is for one bottle of wine at a time or one person on the Titanic at a time. Um, but you can also, I'm just gonna start that running, um, do it for a data set. And so for all of our test bottles of wine, which is a hundred bottles, it took about 15 seconds, but we got the shot values for all of them. And you can look at sort of feature importance. That's something that is pretty, commonly used to um, assess your data set and just take the absolute value of the, the SHAP values across your data set. Um, you can look at, oh, it's going to take a moment because I'm doing this. So I'm jumping ahead and wanted to get this part running. Um, so I can look at questions in a moment, scrolling up. Um, OK, backing up to uh, many explainability frameworks like Lime are based on linear approximation of neural net behavior to implement some process for higher order nonlinear linear explainability. This is very close, actually, uh, to SHAP values. SHAP values are a kernel version of Lime, where uh, it instead of just weighting the features based on the the comparison points to how close they are to your example. Uh, there's a much more complicated way of comparing it, but it is a another local explanation like Lime um, until you start doing all of these um, sort of ensemble explanations. Here we go. So we can look at this on the left is predicted quality versus uh, a feature. So as citric acid, or let's look at chlorides. I don't know, as chlorides goes up, the predicted quality goes down, and that's reflected in our SHAP values. But there's something weird here with free sulfur dioxide, for example, that as the feature goes up, so higher sulfur dioxide, free sulfur dioxide, the impact, so the SHAP value, what that had the, uh, changed the model's prediction 
goes up and then back down. And that's not something you would have seen if you just do the scatter plot initially for what the value is versus the predicted quality of the bottle of wine. So we can start finding some insights into what our model is doing by having combinations of these. Um, but it takes a little bit of work, or you could just call you know, one line, this is our new, new toy shop plots. So for 350 bottles of wine, this is the same information that we just looked at, the right column of it. Um, for each feature, we can look at a point is one bottle of wine. Let's look at the, which one was it that was weird? Um, I think citric acid. So it is colored by the feature value. Gonna... So the dark blue are very low values of citric acid here. And to the left is a negative impact on the quality. And we can see that to the right, values of citric acid that have a positive impact are sort of green, which is the middle. So it's non-linear in a way that was pretty interesting to, to discover. Chlorides, we can see, is much more linear, that low value, values of chloride, the blue dots, have a positive impact on the predicted quality. And yellow, which is the highest values of chlorides, have a negative uh, value or prediction impact. And it gives you a sense of sort of how much each feature can impact the model by looking at how wide it is. Like fi fixed acidity has a very little impact almost ever. And so just by glancing at the SHAP plots, you can get a, an insight into that. Um, unfortunately, the part that is not as technical and more philosophical for what we mean when we're doing SHAP values, uh, I think I'm going to have to race through and talk about later, but uh, there are two general approaches to SHAP values, and it comes in the question of how we replace the missing values. One thing that's great about Mathematica is that every model trains a, a rough and ready imputer that tries to model the distribution of the data. And so we can actually do an observational sort of um, approach that we remove the data and then fill it in based on what we know, which has the interesting impact of sort of spreading out the impact across different features. If you can predict that somebody has high blood pressure because of their high salt diet, if you remove the information about their blood pressure, you can still predict their risk of a heart attack because you know that the diet predicts the blood pressure. And so uh, it spreads impact across a few different features, which is weird if the model doesn't even use diet at all, that changing the value of the diet isn't going to change the prediction. So we say that that style is true to the data rather than to the model. Um, and this can find proxy variables. This is sort of thing where a model doesn't use race, but it uses zip code and that's being used as a proxy. Um, maybe zip code is very relevant and that's for you as a human in the loop to know and to, to judge. But um, uh, if it's not, you can find something a little fishy. Um, the other style is to change the value. So not conditioning the imputed values on what you know at all and just you know, sort of manually changing it. It's closer to the ice plots, actually. Um, and this is exactly what the model will do, that if you change one value of the input, the output will change an explained amount. But there's the trade-off that it's on some weird data because you're not constraining it to the distribution of data that you got that made sense in reality. For example, you might be assessing an 18-year-old's risk of cervical cancer after 22 years of taking hormonal birth control. Um, you know, if you don't condition on the fact that the patient is 18, you might be you know, getting some nonsensical stuff for your model that um, it wasn't trained to do. And so you can get those by enforcing that your model has independence between features, um, which is in the notebook. And we don't have to go into it because I am near the end and would love to take some questions. So let me pull over to that and zoom up. Um, Lime, root on the building models to design. Shay, I think I've seen uh, the question, have you seen uh, Rune 2018 on building models that by design are interpretable instead of trying to post hoc analyze a black box model? Does Mathematica have anything to support that approach? Um, you know, it is, 
I think I'm less enthusiastic about the simpler models, maybe, sorry, the interpretable models that are usually simpler. Um, I mean, this gets back to one of the earlier questions about bias and variance that the models that are interpretable tend to have more underfitting um, because they're simpler. They're things that human beings can understand, which is somewhat limited in a lot of cases. But we have so much data for most of our machine learning problems these days. I mean, big data revolution is maybe not quite as uh, much of a buzzword, but we have so much data that we can afford to make our models more complicated and not risk too much variance trade-off. So if we have lots of data and we can get better performance by a model that's a little bit um, less interpretable, it's a hard thing to give up. Uh, the best excuse I think would be to make, or the best explanation and argument I could make is that the interpretable models are less likely to go horribly wrong or be answering the wrong question. Um, so a long-winded way, I guess, of saying, I like the argument and don't expect it to be um, as successful or popular. Um, feature engineering doesn't, for feature engineering, does it work for 12.3, only for 13? Yep, these are uh, 12, 13 um, version features that you saw with uh, SHAP values is actually in 12.3, SHAP values itself, but the SHAP plot and ICE plot are in 13. Um, where explainability is closely related to transfer learning. How do how the current tools apply? Do we plan on working in this area more? Hmm. I'll have to think about that. Um, yeah, I guess there are some cases where you transfer convolutional net filters, so things that are trained to spot particular um, visual features like lines or at the higher level eyes is the classic example, um, and using those. I personally haven't done much with those. Um, the neural net team has done more about the sort of surgery on nets and cutting it open and taking out some layers, but um, that does seem like one way we could get uh, explainability from at least convolutional neural nets. And I think last question, sorry for the people after this, but uh, can we just for each value, variable shuffle the values and see how much worse predictions we get instead of chat values? That is actually another approach and it, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it, but um, instead of looking at the impact that the feature had, it's looking at the impact on the model's quality. So it helps you know the importance of a feature if your model quality drops off, but you don't know necessarily Ooh, I think I ran out of time. Um, all right. So fine, you got 10 more minutes. Before oh, OK, great. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the model quality might drop off, but it doesn't explain the decision itself. So it's two slightly different things, but it's absolutely something that you can, can do. Um, it runs into the same problem that features might be interconnected and shuffling one feature at a time it might be um, sort of accounted for by a different feature in the model picking up the slack. So the sort of interdependencies is something that SHAP values does that uh, very few other things can. Uh, and I think uh, SHAP values, neural nets trained, SHAP values can go on anything that can uh, be put into classify and predict in the moment in Mathematica. In theory, it can be applied to anything just with ease of use for Wolf well, Mathematica, um, anything that you can put into the classify and predict, which I believe nets can. Uh, thanks for the questions. I would love to get to the others. I'll be around uh, and feel free to email me, jessieg at wolfram.com. But otherwise, uh, let me know if you have any particular projects that you would love to have some sort of interpretability angle on. Uh, I'd love to talk with you and work on it and see what else we might want to implement in the future. Thanks so much.